Chapter three deals with ethics and privacy, which is really important in business. And especially as we deal with technology and the uh, vulnerabilities that technology creates to our privacy. So before we get started, we have to, as usually, deal with some basic definitions. So what is ethics? It's basically just the principles of right and wrong that we use every day to make a decision. Why do we decide to do some things and not to do others? The real challenge for business professionals is that there's no universal global standard. What is ethical in the United States may be unethical in the Middle East. And likewise, what is ethical in Asia may not be considered ethical in the United States. And so that creates a real challenge for businesses that do business on a global basis. Now, four widely used standards as the author goes through, and I won't go into great detail on this. You can read about it, the, what's the difference between the utilitarian, the rights approach, fairness, common good approach. But bottom line is, I think that we all apply aspects of all four of those approaches when we're making our ethical decisions. So it's important for you to go ahead and familiarize yourself with how the author lays that out and describes what those principles are. Now, the fundamental tenets of ethics in a corporate environment, or for that matter, in our own personal environment, is this idea of responsibility, accountability, and liability. Responsibility really comes down to the fact of all of us accepting the consequences of our own decisions and actions. And of course, accountability is just a determination of who was actually responsible for a particular action or activity that took place. And then liability is dealing with the legal issues around who uh, has to provide compensation to make things right, to address damages caused, and so forth. Privacy pretty easy to understand. It's just basically the right to be left alone and to be free of someone intruding onto our space. We all want the ability to say, leave me alone. And where that becomes a challenge in the technology area is this whole concept of information privacy. We want to know under what conditions our information is made available to others. That gets into medical issues. There's laws around, they're called HIPAA. And then as students, you also want to control information about you as a student, and those are covered under the FERPA laws. Some other interesting things, though, comes into property and ownership issues with digital. For instance, who owns the photos that you upload and post on Facebook, Instagram, you know, any of the, the sharing social media sites? Did you read the terms when you signed up for that to determine, do you really retain ownership of that once you post it? Or were you giving consent to that website that they could now do whatever they wanted to with that? that photo. And one issue that has arisen uh, specifically with Facebook is what happens when someone dies. There have been cases, uh, the one that most notably was in the news, a family where their young child, teenage child, was killed and they didn't have access to the most recent communications from the their child and they wanted to access that the deceased Facebook account so they could re regain some of the photos and other things to remember him and it became an issue that they did not own that content and couldn't get access to it. And this is another aspect of or another example of where technology is changing faster than our laws are and that there's no clear legal precedent set yet on that as to who owes that does it pass to the estate of the person who died 
When it comes to privacy, one thing, though, where the courts have ruled is that the right of privacy is not absolute. Our own personal privacy always has to be balanced against the needs of society. Think of the example with the shootings that occurred, uh, I believe it was in San Bernardino, and the FBI wanted to hack into the cell phone of the individuals that that did that, uh, you know, create uh, committed that crime to find out if there were others in relationship with them that might be planning similar attacks. And so their right to have privacy of their phone calls and email was overridden by the needs of society to you know to look into that criminal activity it granted it's a dangerous precedent where do you draw the line and it's a challenge that the courts are setting precedent but in general there is consensus that your right to privacy is not absolute and it's up to the courts to determine is the benefit to society more than your benefit to privacy Another term you'll hear talked about is profiling, and profiling is not always a bad thing. Profiling is just creating a digital description of someone. This can be your purchasing habits, your conversations. It's just creating a description of you. And there's uh, certainly Facebook, Amazon, there are a lot of companies that use that information to better tailor your experience online. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, but like anything, it can be abused. And here the author gives this concept of digital data aggregators. These are organizations that gather all that publicly available information and publish it. And those are some of the ones on there. One of the common ones is street addresses. And as we'll talk about in the data management software, one thing you can do is to take all of your customer uh, address information and compare it to the post offices address information to identify any possible typos that were created so you can identify anything that needs to be corrected and so that's just an example of a data aggregator where they pull together readily available information and make it available for others to use to help them in their business activities a lot in the news we get more and more about this electronic surveillance the ability of monitoring people who are doing nothing wrong and are not under suspicion of doing anything wrong but just going about their day-to-day -day routine activities this is conducted by employers governments all kinds of different organizations are routinely just monitoring what's going on think about when you go into a shopping uh, mall, go into a store, look up at the ceiling, you see those video cameras that are just watching just to be sure that nothing is going on. And so you see a lot of that, you know, airports, banks, any place where the public can go, there's more and more now you will see a video camera that is, they try and make it as inobtrusive as possible. But if you look carefully, you can see them. Now there's an interesting movie, and especially if you like Benedict Cumberbatch, uh, I believe the movie was first came out in 2006 called The Last Enemy. Uh, currently it's available on Amazon Prime, you can stream it, or if you belong to Netflix, you can get it on DVD, it's not available on streaming on Netflix. But it uh, paints a picture of the future when you have the ultimate surveillance going on and the future that it pick, depicts is kind of scary but it's not really far-fetched when you look at it the technology we currently have in place already 
uh, could very well result in that. And we'll actually talk more about this in class. One of the challenges with electronic surveillance, it's so prevalent now because there's inexpensive digital sensors all over the place. Your laptop camera, video game have sensors built into them, smartphone cameras, utility meters, passports, ID cards. They're everywhere. And so they can easily be gathering information without you even realizing it's going on. And I'll actually show you in class an example uh, that uh, is, <laughs> I hope, a little scary to you. But anyhow, we'll, we'll cover that in class. Another thing to remember is that smartphones create geotags. So when you post that picture of the vacation that you took, there's actually information embedded into that photo about where and when it was taken. And Google and others will take and aggregate those together to create information. You'd need to be aware of that, of anything that you post, because it can be tied back to you. And in at least one case that it was made known to the public, the criminal who had stolen a bunch of money and then posted a photo on Facebook, uh, you know, saying he was enjoying his margaritas, you know, on the beach, it had the geographic information in it and the officials were able to track him down and arrest him. So something to be aware of anytime you post a photo, there's time and location information stored inherently in all photos you upload. And of course, Google and Microsoft, you know, have taken pictures of your, your home. They've driven down your streets and that's caused some problems. In fact, Google got into trouble in Australia for doing that, for driving down the streets and taking videos of the streets without people's permission. And satellite imaging, it's amazing how high quality lenses some of our spy satellites have to where they can zoom down in from way up in, in orbit and space and zoom in and be able to look at and recognize someone's face. So satellite imaging has become very, very uh, precise. There's a number of organizations that keep track of your information for good reasons. And one of the most prevalent ones is credit reporting agencies. They keep track of your payments for your utilities, your cell phone, any credit cards you have. And that's done to assist you in getting an apartment, and making a new purchase, you know, it's a very positive, in, you know, the intent is to help you and assist both you and the merchants to come to good agreements. Unfortunately, that's a lot of really powerful information. And one of the major data breaches that occurred with Equifax exposed a huge number of people in this country expose their private information that could be then used in identity theft. Another, some other organizations that keep track of a lot of personal data, banks and financial institutions, utility companies, your employers, hospitals, the school, and of course, government agencies like the IRS. And yes, guess what? A couple years ago, the IRS got hacked and a lot of people's personal financial information was stolen to be used for identity theft. Major concerns that you should have about these various institutions that are keeping records about you is do you know where all the records about you are located? Are they even accurate? Is there anything you can do to fix inaccurate data? And if even if you can fix it, how long does it take? And under what circumstances can that information be released? So, you know, how is it used? Is it given out? Is it sold? 
in those organizations that have all that information, what steps have they taken to secure your data against access by unauthorized people? Facebook has certainly been in the spotlight here recently on their what a lot of people, including Congress, consider to be totally inadequate measures to protect people's information. Okay, moving on to social networking sites. There's a lot of variety of different social network sites out there, not just Facebook. You've got chat rooms, blogs, all kinds of places where people are interacting. We do have an issue on the internet and particular with organizations such as YouTube and Facebook recently have been removing content that they feel to be offensive. And it really comes down to this question of free speech and also the question of free speech versus privacy. Should you be able to post anything you want on the web and is there any way that the information that you post can be maintained as private or is it just automatically become public? Basically, the caveat I would give you is just be careful what you post on social networking sites because it may get forwarded on, somehow it may get out. Just if it would be an embarrassment to you, then don't post it. A challenge is, though, that just about anyone can post derogatory information about you anonymously. And that can be a real problem. That information can influence people's hiring decisions. Currently, there is little to no recourse for victims to get incorrect information you know, dealt with. There is a company called Reputation Defender, and they claim to remove to be able to remove derogatory information from the web. I have not used them and I do not know of anyone who has used them. So I cannot make any uh, endorsement of their ability to do it. I'm just pointing out that there are companies like Reputation Defender starting to surface because of this issue. Time for this chapter's password. As you can see for this chapter, the password is London. Make sure you write it down. You'll need it to unlock the quiz. Each organization needs to have a privacy code and policy. And you should have been notified over the last few months from all of the different places that you do business with online, whether it's your bank, Amazon, social networking sites, should have sent you information reminding you of what they gather, the cookies that they store on your computer and everything else. This has come about a lot because of the issues with Facebook. When it comes to privacy code and policies, there's some different models. One is called the opt-out model. And this says, if I don't want to continue getting information from you. I can opt out of it. So even though I didn't request that you send me your newsletters, I can always tell you stop. And so that's the opt out model. Opt in is different. Opt in means that that organization cannot send you unsolicited information. You have to request it so you have to opt into it. Now that seems like a better way than opt out. You know, I have to first request it and not, uh, you can't just send me stuff and then I have to take the action to get you to stop. But what people prefer, and as organizations I strongly recommend, is called the double opt-in model. And what this means is that once I make a request and say, yes, please send me stuff, they will then contact me, the organization, and say, we got a request that you want to receive this. Is that correct and valid? 
And so I have to confirm that, yes, in fact, I did ask for that. And yes, I still want to get that. One of the reasons that this came about is that it was really easy if you were mad at somebody and you knew their email address, you could go to a site and just say, yeah, please send all this information to this email address. And all of a sudden the person you're mad at is getting flooded by, you know, a bunch of spam emails with the double opt-in model before you started getting them, they would contact you and say, hey, do you want to get this? And you could say, no, I didn't ask for that. Don't do it. So the double opt-in model is preferred. Privacy on an international basis. Uh, just like with I said in the beginning, there is no universal standard for ethics on a global basis. That really plays over to, to privacy with you know, with the global nature that we have is what are the privacy rules from country to country and how do you how do you manage that? There are a number of organizations that are trying to get a handle on that. One, the US has uh, information practices standards. The European Directive on Data Privacy has you know, been developed. And so there's approximately 50 countries that have some sort of data protection laws. That's not everyone though. There's a number of countries that have nothing. But even amongst the ones that do have it, it's inconsistent as to what the standards are from country to country. So as a business doing business in multiple countries, the challenge we have is trying to be following and adhering to the protection laws in each country. It's a major thing to manage and certainly big companies like Google and Facebook they have not done a very good job necessarily of following the standards in each country. And so with that, that's chapter three, ethics and privacy. There's a lot more information in the textbook. Make sure you read it thoroughly and look forward to talking about this topic with you more in class.